Hello, this is Maz Mushiri, and I'm here to present to you a five minute quick tip video regarding class two correction with aligners. And we have an upcoming webinar on April 30th at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. I certainly hope you all can attend that, or uh, if it's not being attended live, of course, you can reference it via the library on yourorthocoach.com. I find that class two correction with aligners is really quite efficient and offers several advantages that we do not have with fixed appliances. When we assess class two malocclusions, of course, we want to determine what we need to address with regards to etiologies, and some of them are listed here. But what we tend to find if we go through a problem list is that the majority of our class twos have mesial in rotation of their molars, which when derotated, can give us about one to two millimeters of arch length per side. If you're using a product like Invisalign or any other digital treatment planning software where you have a technician that helps to set the case up for you, they tend not to resolve these rotations automatically and they need to be requested. Furthermore, there are certain nuances to the rotation correction, which are very important to capture the benefit of rotation correction. So specifically what I mean by that is you need to make sure that your hinge axis of rotation is through the palatal cusp that allows the cusp on the buckle to drop down and back, giving you that space that you need. But that is not the default rotation from a line. So you have to talk to your technician and make sure you get rotation as shown here so you gain all this beautiful space which then you can distalize the subsequent buckle occlusion into. So this really is my first thing I do with class two uh, correction is to make sure that the molars are derotated. As you can see here in this case, for example, this is an end on class two that's fully resolved with simply derotating the molar. When you get through that and you've decided that you've gone through and you've uh, addressed the molar rotation correction, the next question that you have to ask yourself is, do I then need a bite jump? Meaning. Once you've resolved the molars and you've distalized all the, into all the space created, is there still any overjet or class two correction remaining? And then you have to ask yourself, well, what would I do if this was fixed appliances? If there's two millimeters of overjet remaining and it's a 14 year old female, would you address that with just rubber bands only in arch coordination? And the answer would be yes, I probably would. But if there was six millimeters of overjet remaining and the patient was still at end on class two, after molar rotation correction. Well, then you need to ask yourself again, is arch coordination with simple elastic wear, uh, AKA what's shown virtually as a bite jump, is that feasible, is that predictable, is that gonna happen? And more than likely, if it's that much, the answer is no. So then you can look into adjuncts such as distalization, which we'll discuss here uh, in, this, in this webinar upcoming. You can also, of course, uh, do upper body extraction. You could use Curie distalizers. There's many ways to skin a class two, of course. It depends on how your patient presents to you, what you're comfortable with using. You could use a mandibular advancement feature, for example, if it's a growing teen. Uh, but in this instance, we'll talk about segmental distalization. So segmental distalization is when the aligner essentially forces itself between the terminal molars, causing them to distalize. Of course, when you do this, there's a reciprocal mesial force as well of what you need to capture with a class two elastic. So we'll go through uh, a, a case example here to kind of show you a combination of what we've been discussing to this point, where we have a young man that presents with a class two subdivision right, deep bite malocclusion. And as we get through here and look at his records, our goals are to distalize the buckle segment. You can see how nicely things have turned out. We're gonna go through and look at the clinch check to see how we got there exactly. And that was his refinement that was just shown there. The main tenets here is that, of course, when you're distalizing, the plastic is pushing. Many times you need to have actual attachments to help you with that. So a line recently has come up with the G7 attachments that tend to capture these push forces very nicely. This case is showing uh, kind of the G7 push surfaces before they were offered and available to us from a line. Having a push surface to push distally on, yet something to keep the tooth in the aligner. So as we see here, we're getting distalization, and then we start moving the teeth into the space created. And this is all backed up by a class two elastic. Since this patient is a teenager, we are gonna leave some room for bite jump, which represents growth in arch coordination, 
or uh, one or the other, or a combination of both. It depends on, again, what you feel like your patient's going to do for you. I didn't want to completely distalize all the occlusion. That would have added an unnecessary number of liners here. And I think that having a combination of what I'd shown was just right for this individual. This, again, was the uh, result at refinement. And then we went through and just did some minor detailing of the cuspid and finished this case up. So we're going to get into much more detail on cases such as uh, this young man at the upcoming webinar, and I appreciate your time and attention for this five-minute quick tip video, and we again will look forward to speaking to you here at 8 p.m. Eastern on April 30th. Have a wonderful day. Take care.